So good morning and welcome everyone. Happy New Year. Um, thank you all for joining us this morning um, for today's first Saturday webinar. Um, and we're kicking off the new year 2021. Um, now in its 20th season, uh, First Saturday PDX is a monthly continuing education program series offering a wide range of Chinese history, culture, and art-related topics. Um, our programs are always free and open to the public. The title of today's talk is Hidden Treasures, A Century of Collecting Chinese Painting at Oberlin College. And our speaker today is Dr. Kevin Greenwood. Uh, good morning and Happy New Year's 2021 to everyone. Uh, my name is Dennis Lee and it's my privilege to introduce today's speaker. Someone who is acquainted with many of you and myself when he resided here in the Portland area while teaching at Willamette University, uh, Pacific University, and Portland Community College. We also know Kevin Greenwood from his many lectures on Chinese art and Chinese garden architecture for the Portland Art Museum, its Asian uh, Art Council, Lansu Chinese Garden, Portland's Japanese Garden, Northwest China Council, and First Saturday PDX. His lectures are always characterized by thoughtfulness, insightfulness, clarity and scholarship, and invariably with unique gems of knowledge. After graduating from the University of Kansas, uh, Kevin Greenwood uh, became the curator of Asian art at the Allen Memorial Art Museum at Oberlin College and joins us today from Oberlin, Ohio. His topic, A Century of Collecting Chinese Paintings, will explore and highlight the museum's unique a collection which ranges from the 14th to the 21st centuries. Please join me in welcoming our friend and speaker, Dr. R. E. Kevin Greenwood. Hi there. Good morning. Thank you, Dennis, for that introduction. Um, is can everyone hear me okay? I hopefully things are things are working out. Um, I want to especially thank Catherine Ling and Jen for doing such a, a meticulous and wonderful job of organizing things. But I think all all thanks really go to Dennis. Um, we've kept up, uh, we've kept in touch over over the past years, and uh, he he knew that I have family uh, and and many friends in Portland, and and my family were were back in Portland with some frequency. And he had always wanted to arrange for me to speak again uh, to the First Saturday group. So it's really a, a great pleasure to be back uh, speaking to you, even though I can't see you. <laughs> it was uh, always one of the great uh, pleasures of my time in Portland was when I had an opportunity to speak to such a uh, enthusiastic and, and really educated group. Of, uh, of fans. And I have to demonstrate my, uh, my bona fides with the classical garden uh, group in Portland. I have the original t-shirt that was <laughs> a fundraiser, uh, even before the garden was built. When I was a, a graduate student at the U University of Oregon uh, in the late 90s, when things were just kind of coming together for the, for the garden, I, I bought that t-shirt. So been there, done that, got the t-shirt, happy to Happy to show it off. I didn't wear it for the talk today, but anyway. Well, what I'd like to do uh, now, I'm going to uh, shift over to my uh, my PowerPoint uh, and just get into uh, the talk today. So uh, I'm hoping that uh, everyone could see that. Um, I uh, the talk today is entitled "The Century of uh, Collecting Chinese Painting at Oberlin College." And I'm uh, really motivated to, to bring this uh, to you because it's a relatively unknown collection. It hasn't been well published. Uh, really only specialists are, uh, are familiar with it. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's really one of my uh, great goals as, as the curator of, of Asian art uh, at the Oberlin Collection to kind of make it a, a little bit better known. So this will be part of that effort, uh, effort today. So, what I'd like to do today is uh, begin with a quick, a quick introduction 
to the Allen Memorial Art Museum uh, at Oberlin College uh, and some of the things that we do with the, uh, with the collection there. I'd like to um, also uh, dis, you know, kind of turn to the meat of our, of our talk, uh, the history and highlights of the Chinese painting collection. And then finally, uh, give you uh, an example of some of the selected exhibitions of, uh, of, that have used the permanent collection of Chinese painting uh, over the past few years since I've been at Oberlin. So the, as you see in this image here, this is the Allen Memorial Art Museum at, at Oberlin College. Um, we're usually classified in like the top 10 uh, academic art museums in the country, and that's up against the heavy hitters like Yale, Harvard, Princeton, uh, and it's really on the strength of our uh, collection. We have a, a wonderful collection of about 15,000 works. Uh, almost a quarter of them are works of Asian art, um, and the museum uh, itself was built, the, the first part of the museum in 1917, the left part that sort of you know, Italianate style building you can see, uh, it looks like a palazzo over on the left. Uh, that was designed by Cass Gilbert, a uh, very well-known uh, American architect. He designed the Woolworth Building uh, in New York City that was uh, for, a, for a time the highest building in the world. He also designed the Supreme Court uh, Building. Hopefully that will, uh, will be there in the next, uh, the next few weeks. Um, also, we manage a, uh, a Frank Lloyd Wright house, the Weltheimer Johnson house that you can see below there, uh, that's open to the public in the summer. We have uh, uh, recently, if you want to really get a sense of what it's like inside uh, the museum, we have an augmented uh, reality uh, tour that's available. And I think uh, in, in the link, uh, we'll give you a, a, you know, in the chat, we'll, we'll give you a link to that. Uh, you can kind of, you know, walk through some of the galleries and click on labels and, and look at the art and get a sense of the space uh, in the museum. Teaching with the collection is a, a really a major part of what we do as, as an academic art museum. And we've endeavored uh, to make the art collection, you know, working with actual original works of art, uh, an integral part of many classes at, at Oberlin. Um, and that includes, you know, not only humanities classes and, you know, art history and art classes, but, uh, but also, you know, the sciences and math and even uh, sports science. I mean, we, we have a really creative team in the academic outreach department that their job is to work specifically with, uh, with, the, um, with the classes, with faculty to develop visits. Our docent program uh, is uh, all done by uh, students. Uh, we, we, you know, unlike a lot of museums that have, you know, typically retirees or others, um, ours is, is staffed entirely by students. They go through a training program uh, in our winter term, which is the month of January. Uh, and then they, uh, they teach not only uh, for the college classes, but also uh, in K through 12 education. And curators are uh, very actively involved in teaching, uh, not only teaching in the galleries, uh, but also we have this wonderful print study room uh, that is where uh, faculty and, and, uh, and curators can bring out works of art that are in storage uh, to be used specifically in, uh, you know, specially designed classes. And you can see some of that action going on in this uh, collection of images. Oberlin is also kind of famous for its art rental uh, program where uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's not the regular collection, it's a separate collection of, of works, but uh, it is, um, you know, available for students. Uh, works are available to rent for $5. Uh, and they can take them back, hang them in their dorm rooms. Um, knock on wood, we have never lost or damaged uh, any of the art in the art rental collection. Um, and so it's really been a, a very uh, wonderful program. Uh, you can look on the website uh, of the Allen for videos about it and, and videos about other things as well. So what we really endeavor to do with, uh, with the collection is to provide new ways of seeing uh, to visitors, uh, be it K through 12, the public or uh, you know, of course, Oberlin students and, and faculty. This is a group, uh, I think it's sixth graders uh, that are looking up at the, our restored uh, ceiling painting uh, in the main sculpture court of the museum. So I'm gonna turn now to uh, the next part and sort of the bulk of my talk today, which is the history uh, and the highlights of the, of the Chinese uh, painting collection. And maybe give you a little bit of background to some of the donors uh, as well as some of the paintings themselves. Our first uh, Chinese paintings actually were gifts from uh, Charles Freer, uh, who, you know, many of you that know about Asian art are, are familiar with the Freer Gallery 
that's part of the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Uh, and uh, he, you know, donated his very sizable collection of art to the to the nation. Uh, the Freer Gallery opened in 1923. But before that, he was kind of distributing other works from his collection to universities and to colleges. And Oberlin got about 100 works uh, back in 1912. Um, of that uh, collection of 100, uh, 52 remain, uh, mostly ceramics and, and painting and, and a couple of sculptures. Um, but it was a really important gift. Uh, Oberlin was known for connections with Asia already because of, uh, you know, uh, uh, missionary activity uh, in, in uh, East Asia. And so I think that may have been one of the connections when the president of Oberlin reached out to uh, Mr. Freer, who lived up in Detroit, and uh, asked if he might donate. And so two of the paintings, I'll just show you very briefly, uh, one by the, uh, well, it's attributed to the artist Wang Hui, a very important uh, Orthodox school artist of the early Qing dynasty. Uh, although chances are it's by a student. Um, uh, scholars that have looked at it have suggested that it's not by Wang Hui himself, although it has a, an inscription and a seal of the artist. Those may have been later editions. But it's a wonderful example of you know, a very talented student, if it is a student, uh, that has a, a beautiful little image of a waterfall and a rocky outcropping uh, with a, a village or perhaps some sort of uh, elite, uh, you know, uh, group of, uh, you know, like a, like a, a place where uh, wealthy people would live, like kind of a villa in the countryside. And this big, chunky rock outcropping very much in the style of uh, Wang Meng, who was an influence on Wang Hui, and obviously that carried on into this student. Another wonderful painting from uh, Freer uh, was this one called Auspicious Still Life. It's a when I came into the collection, it struck me as this phenomenally uh, detailed and fascinating uh, image that nobody knew anything about. So I did quite a lot of research on it. Um, at the top are a series of Taoist talismans and an image of Zhong Kui, uh, who's a, a sort of a, a ghost buster in the spirit world. He fights demons uh, you know, to, to save people from, from trouble. Um, and he particularly was, uh, was believed to protect from smallpox. So, you know, during a pandemic, uh, you know, very auspicious image indeed. And down below are, are images that are part of this wonderful language of symbolic uh, uh, rebuses, right? Where uh, visual, visual puns basically uh, that, uh, you know, that are so beloved among educated people in China. If you want know, to know more information about this painting, uh, please watch a video, uh, uh, search for Tuesday Tea Talk with Kevin Greenwood on auspicious still life. And I did a whole, you know, 50 minute or so video about this very subject. Our next Chinese paintings came in actually from the founders of the Allen Memorial Art Museum. Uh, and uh, it was uh, Dr. Dudley Peter Allen, who was a grad 1875 graduate of the college on the board of trustees uh, and his wife, uh, Elizabeth Severance Allen, uh, who began the process of building a, a, a museum for Oberlin. Um, sadly, Dr. Allen passed away during that process, but uh, Mrs. Allen continued, uh, continued it even after she later uh, remarried uh, and uh, continued to donate funds for um, you know, operating funds, but also she bequested, uh, bequeathed, excuse me, uh, a number of works of art, uh, some of them being Chinese paintings. And she had an interesting, uh, really interesting taste. She had some very unusual types of paintings that weren't typically collected by people, uh, you know, in the early 20th century. This wonderful work of, of Buddhist art, an image of uh, Luohans or Arhats, these Buddhist uh, deities, uh, you know, kind of like uh, apostles, I guess you'd say. Um, and it's done with this beautiful blue background that was supposed to, it was painted in, but it was to imita imitate uh, indigo dyed paper that was used for very, uh, you know, luxurious Buddhist sutras and, and paintings uh, that were popular uh, from the Song Dynasty onward. Another painting she donated it to us uh, is a blue and green landscape in the style of Chou Ying. It has, uh, you know, a, a signature of Chou Ying and seals of Chou Ying, but probably by a, a, later, uh, a later student. When I first came to the museum, this is what that painting looked like. It was framed and had some significant water damage from this uh, ceiling leak that had happened, I think in the, in the 80s. Um, and it really needed a lot of work. There were a lot of uh, losses and increases. We were able to get a grant from the Carpenter Foundation uh, and uh, the work was uh, sent to a conservator in, uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, Yuan Li Ho, who is the Chinese painting conservator for the Metropolitan Museum. 
uh, and she is the the James Brown of Chinese painting conservation, the hardest working woman in conservation because she has a private studio, uh, you know, outside of her work for the for the Met. Uh, and so she was able to take this in for us and worked on it. I guess after after you know working on things for the Met, uh, which means that we had to be patient. It took a while, but she did a fabulous job. Uh, turned it from a framed uh, painting back into its original hand scroll format. And we're really, really pleased with uh, what she was able to accomplish with this wonderful painting. Another donor, uh, a woman named Mary McClure, she was a 1918 graduate of Oberlin uh, and became a missionary in East Asia. Um, during uh, World War II, she was actually imprisoned by uh, the Japanese army uh, in 1942, uh, was let go after a period of time, uh, went back to the States and then actually on her way back to China during the war, 1944, she uh, contracted a disease in uh, Calcutta uh, and uh, sadly passed away in India on her way back to China. But she be uh, bequeathed a number of works to us, including this very important painting. This is by the artist Yun Bing, who, you know, there are very few canonical women painters uh, in the history of Chinese art. Uh, and, and Yun Bing is one of them. So we're very, very lucky. And, and you know, there are not very many of these paintings out there. So we're very excited to have this uh, wonderful example of her work. Uh, Yun Bing was known for painting in what they call the, the boneless style, right? Not having an outline, but actually using colors to, uh, to you know, create texture and, uh, and you know, modalities to, uh, to, to painting. Um, the boneless style, of course, later used in chicken preparation. Um, but <laughs> this one is an example of one of those rebuses. It includes uh, peonies and garden rocks. Uh, peonies are known as the flowers of, of uh, wealth and honor, of uh, fuguihua. And so combining them with a the symbol of longevity in the rock creates wishes for, uh, for you know, wealth, honor, and longevity. Something completely different. In 1957, we were given a painting uh, by the, the modern Chinese painter uh, Zhao Wuqi or Zhao Wuji in uh, the Mandarin pronunciation. Uh, he was, uh, you know, he studied uh, Western painting in China, studied at the Hangzhou uh, School of Fine Art, uh, went to Paris and uh, eventually became a French citizen uh, and painted in this, you know, wonderful modernist style. It has elements of Paul Klee. He was interested in the, in the work of Paul Klee. But if you look, if we jump ahead and look at some of the details, you know, there are mountains in the background that look like they could have been, you know, out of a Zhao Mengfu painting and in the foreground, a little figure in a hut. Uh, so some, and you know, the trees on a mountaintop, some of these elements that seem to uh, reflect his, uh, his origins or his knowledge of traditional Chinese painting as well. Um, uh, Zhao Wuqi is, is sort of really hot in, uh, in Chinese art right now um, and, and a wonderful painter. And we're really lucky to have this, this work, an oil painting, I should have said. In 1973, uh, we were able to purchase this uh, wonderful painting by the artist Xiao Yuncong, who was associated with the Orthodox painters, painted in a literati style, uh, but wasn't officially considered an Orthodox painter. He was from Anhui. So there are some elements in his style that are reminiscent of the, the Anhui school of, you know, uh, like the artist Hongren, uh, who was a contemporary uh, and others, a younger contemporary of Xiao Yuncong. Um, let me just click through some wonderful images of this of this painting, it's a long hand scroll, uh, like uh, it's it's a, it's in the style of Huang Gongguang. So it has these very busy passages and then very quiet passages that suggest almost a, a piece of music. And in in fact, when I was uh, introducing this to a class at one point, I, I mentioned that that hand scrolls have this character that's similar to the way a work of music unfolds over time because hand scrolls have that time element. Uh, and a student named Joshua Biggs, who graduated, I think, in uh, uh, 2018, he was in the music composition department at Oberlin. He composed a, a percussive piece that was performed and recorded. And, uh, you know, it, it was really wonderful. And, and I'm, I'm uh, hoping to be able to install that, uh, install the work and have that music available for people uh, at some point in the future. 1994, uh, we acquired uh, this wonderful painting by the artist Pu Jin, or uh, Pu, uh, Pu Xue Jai, who was a member of the Manchu royal family. He was the cousin of uh, Pu Yi, the last emperor. Uh, and this painting has a really interesting and uh, kind of touching history, I guess you'd say. If we, if we zoom into the horse itself, it's a copy 
of a very famous painting by the much earlier Song Dynasty artist Gong Kai, or Yuan Dynasty artist Gong Kai. And it's now it's in the Osaka Museum of, of Fine Arts, City Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, you can see how he's he's based his uh, his work on that 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 work the Gonkai work was originally in the Imperial Collection, so he may have seen it uh, at that point. But it it has like a slighter degree of uh, realism, I I would say, a greater degree of realism. Uh, notice that the hair is flopping differently, kind of revealing the horse's neck uh, more more prominently. But the thing that really strikes me about it are the many inscriptions on at the top of the painting that were poems written by uh, really Qing loyalists, many of whom were associated with the puppet state of Manchukuo that was set up by, uh, by the Japanese empire in Manchuria, the, the original homeland of, of, the, uh, of the Qing uh, royal family, the, the Manchus. And so they're, they're, they're using this traditional idea of a, a horse out to pasture as a symbol of scholars that are not be able to serve their their emperor, right? And so um, it's really a, a very poignant work when you read all the all the labels. They're all available on our on our website if you want to uh, look more deeply into this. You will have an opportunity uh, in a in a couple of years to see this painting installed with the Gongkai painting in uh, uh, an exhibition called Galloping Through Dynasties. That's going to be at the Cincinnati Museum of Art um, uh, it, it, sometime in the next few years. It should be a very impressive. Uh, uh, exhibition with many of the most famous paintings of horses from Chinese tradition. The next uh, important stage, and really the, I would say the most important stage in the development of the Chinese painting collection was during uh, the curatorship of uh, Charles Mason, who was at the Allen from 1996 to 2003. Currently, he's at the Kreisinger Art Museum uh, that's part of Hope College up in, up in Michigan. Uh, he's the director there. Um, but when he was the, uh, the curator of Asian art at the Allen, he had this fantastic opportunity. That opportunity was to acquire part of the George Schlenker collection. Uh, and the George Schlenker collection was uh, organized by, by James Cahill, a man who probably doesn't need any introduction to this group, uh, one of the most influential scholars of Chinese art in the United States. Um, now, Sch George Schlenker was the stepfather of uh, Professor Cahill, uh, and was a surgeon and you know, wanted to invest in Chinese painting and maybe help out his stepson. So uh, he, over the years, uh, Professor Cahill was able to acquire uh, a, a very impressive collection of Chinese and Japanese paintings sponsored by Dr. Schlenker. And Professor Cahill used it in teaching at Berkeley. So anyone, who, many, any of the many prominent art historians who studied under Cahill knew this collection very well because he used it as part of his connoisseurial training. Uh, and Charles Mason was one of Cahill's uh, students. So in uh, 1997, after the death of uh, Dr. Schlenker, the collection came on the market and uh, Charles was able to acquire uh, the, the uh, collection for, uh, or at least the Chinese paintings in the collection for the Allen. Uh, 13 hanging scrolls, two hand scrolls, and three uh, albums. We're gonna kind of briefly look through all of them. Um, the Japanese part of the collection ended up at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. Uh, there were 12 hanging scrolls in that collection. The Schlenker uh, collection includes uh, a, a wide variety of paintings that were you know, appropriate to their academic use by Professor Cahill, Buddhist paintings, Orthodox school, uh, Suzhou painters, Yangzhou painters, Zhejiang painters, and also some 20th century painters. We're gonna see just a few examples of these. In Buddhist paintings, the most important, and, and in fact, the oldest painting in the Allen collection is this 14th century uh, painting of an Arhat or Lohan, uh, who I, I talked about a little bit earlier. It's a very dark painting. It's kind of hard to make out, but if you look carefully at it, it's, it's you know, very, Beautifully crafted, uh, meticulous image that shows uh, one of these uh, one of these figures uh, represented as a sort of urbane abbot, right? A sort of sophisticated uh, urbane monk uh, that you wouldn't recognize him as a as an arhat unless you could see the tiny halo that surrounds his head. Down below are uh, foreigners presenting gifts to uh, the arhat. A, a, a nod to the cosmopolitanism of Buddhism, that it was not just a Chinese religion, but one uh, through, you know, known throughout the world. And that was sort of trumpeted as part of Buddhist art back in the day. For the Orthodox school, uh, I'll just show you two, where there were quite a few. Uh, this is by uh, Wang Jian, who was one of a group of artists 
uh, at the early Qing dynasty who were known as the four Wangs. They all have this, the family name Wang. Only two of them were related, but they all just happen to share this family name. So they're known as the, you know, the, the four Wangs. Um, and uh, Wang Jian was in that orthodox school, uh, you know, known for its synthesis of the traditions of the great literati painters of the Yuan Dynasty and, and, and Ming Dynasty. Um, this is a, just this beautiful painting of uh, hills and a landscape and a tiny village nestled in there. Uh, you look at the hills, you can see, again, the influence of Huang Gong Wang, the use of what's called the, the hemp fiber texture stroke used to kind of articulate the, the, the peaks and valleys of, of, that, of that hill there. Another of the four Wangs, uh, Wang Yunqi, uh, who was a younger contemporary of, uh, of uh, Wang Jian. Uh, in this case, if you know your Chinese painting, immediately you recognize this is the style of the Yuan Dynasty master Ni Zan, known for his very sparse, very austere uh, landscapes. Um, and in this case, just a beautiful example of someone working in that, in that particular style. For Suzhou painters, uh, here's a, a wonderful and very large painting by uh, Xie Shichen, who was a, a, a you know a, a professional painter, uh, painted very large, dramatic uh, works like this one. This one's about 70 inches high by 30 inches wide. So the type of painting that so, uh, you know a wealthy family in Suzhou would display in their uh, in their home to kind of show off their uh, their their wealth and, and their uh, sophistication. Uh, the subject matter is uh, Limbu who was a famous uh, eremitic poet um, who you know, lived uh, around Westlake and uh, always said that you know, the pine tree uh, was his wife, or sorry, not the pine, the plum tree was his wife and the cranes were his children and was very, wrote a lot of beautiful poetry about nature and mysticism uh, and was a sort of a wonderful cultural icon of the, of the region. Another wonderful uh, collection of paintings that we have uh, by a Suzhou artist is by the artist Zhang Hong, also a professional painter. Not that much is known about him. Uh, he moved in sort of literati circles, but he himself was uh, was you know not uh, one of one of the literati. But the subject matter of this album, this is really one of my favorite paintings in the collection, uh, are are scenes of you know sort of famous eccentric figures in uh, the literati tradition or the poet poetic tradition. Um, and so I'm going to click through a couple of these. There are uh, 14 leaves, but I'll, you know, and you can see a few of them here. But I'll show you details of a couple of them. This is an image of the nymph of the Law River, a famous po prose poem, um, and uh, written by a, a man who was known as being one of these sort of eccentric, you know, uh, characters. Um, and so on, on it, it, it has the inscription by Zhang Hong. On a summer day in 1649, I was relaxing in the mountains. Whenever my friends talked about the elegant, dissolute, chivalrous, or unusual characters from the past, I could not help applauding and got carried away. So I returned home and painted these 14 leaves. Although the brushwork is simple and clumsy, the images are still agreeable, avoiding the false and the vulgar. I hope that viewers will not reproach the artist. Well, we certainly will not reproach the artist because they're all wonderful. This one is this wonderful image of sort of drunken scholars after, you know, having a wonderful uh, time together uh, and they're trying to make it make their way home, right? One of them is so drunk that he's being dragged on a little cart. Another guy has his shirt falling off as he gesticulates wildly and there leading them is, is a young man with a with a sprig of plum blossoms very much in this in the you know spirit of seasonal renewal. An image here of Nizan, the famous painter that I mentioned a moment ago, who was sort of famously um, clean. Everything had to be perfectly clean for Nizan. He was a little bit, uh, you know, compulsive in, in that respect. In fact, in a famous story, he sent his servants out to wash the trees in the garden. And that's what we see in this image is uh, Nizan's poor servants out there washing <laughs> trees. This is another famous uh, story of the great calligrapher Zhang Xu, who was inspired in, to, in after a time of sort of, uh, a, you know, he had a sort of a writer's block, I guess you'd say, as a calligrapher. Uh, but he was inspired by the dance of the Lady Gong Sun. It was a Tang Dynasty uh, event. And by her, you know, flowing sword dance, 
uh, he was inspired to, you know, great heights of, of creativity uh, and his calligraphy, you know, was renowned after the, after the fact. So this is an image of Zhang Xu uh, inspired by Lady Gongsun. In fact, he is so excited that he's thrown his brush into the air. You can see it sort of floating in midair there. This one called Ancient Erudition is a scene of a uh, gentleman looking at antiquities, right? The in, antiquities market was a really big thing in the early Qing uh, dynasty uh, that, you know, people would compete with each other, you know, to kind of show off their antiquities. And so it, uh, in a sense, is kind of poking fun at uh, these elegant gentlemen and their, uh, you know, their uh, interest in these sort of crass material things, I guess you'd say. And this is one of my favorites. So this is a village schoolroom. Of course, many members of the literati were not able to pass the examination and ended up, uh, you know, teaching in village schools uh, or in local community colleges, let's say. Um, and this is an image, as, as I did, uh, and this is an image of, uh, if I zoom in, of uh, a teacher, uh, you know, with his, with his uh, cares here. Um, and if you look closely, you can see um, this little figure to the right has toys on the shelf where he's supposed to be reading his book, but you can see the toys down below that he's playing with. In the center is a boy who's being punished and he has to kneel and read you know, the text. Um, and uh, if, he, if he reads something incorrectly, there's another little boy next to him with a stick that's supposed to whack him uh, if he, <laughs> if he mis, uh, misstates something. So anyway, just a, a marvelous little slice of life uh, from a, a local village schoolroom. Uh, for Young Joe painters, there's a wonderful album of 12 leaves by the artist Gao Feng Han, who was uh, a literatus. He actually served uh, in the government, but he had um, what some feel may have been a stroke, uh, you know, in his career and uh, was unable to continue serving. And, and in fact, uh, he wasn't able to move his, his right hand afterwards. And he learned how to paint with his left hand. But that, the fact that he, he sort of learned this this method of painting with his left hand inspired him to even greater heights of creativity. He learned how to paint with his fingernails. So some of the albums in the landscapes in this amazing series were, were sort of proudly painted with his fingernails. He even includes it in an inscription. I'll show you an example in just a moment. He was, uh, and that eccentric behavior, not surprisingly, he was associated with a group of painters known as the eight eccentrics of Yang Zhou. These are some of the works in the collection, in the uh, album, and this is one that he painted with his fingernails, right? An amazing, uh, amazing achievement. Uh, folks from the Chinese garden group will uh, particularly love these portraits of garden rocks from, uh, from you know, this one from, from a friend's garden. And he writes this elaborate uh, essay about the rock that sounds a lot like the first chapter of the dream of the, the red chamber or Hong Lo Meng or the story of the stone, it's also known as, where they talk about this rock that fell from the, you know, the rainbow in heaven and was, you know, incarnated as a, a boy in, uh, named Bao Yu in, the, in the, the Jia family. Read the book, it's a wonderful book. Here's another uh, example of portraits of rocks in the garden of, uh, of a friend of his in, uh, in, in the city of Yangzhou. 20th century paintings, there are quite a few uh, in the collection of uh, the, the Schlenker collection, but one I'll highlight is by the infamous uh, uh, Zhang Daiqian, uh, who was this amazing painter, a very, very gifted painter, wonderful technique. Uh, he could imitate all of the great uh, masters of the past. Uh, he was very creative on his own, uh, but his ability to, to master the styles of these earlier painters also uh, lent itself to his other career as one of the great forgers in uh, Chinese art. Uh, and so he has kind of a bad reputation among art historians for that aspect of his career, but you can't deny his, his amazing skills. This one done in the style of Shi Tao, uh, a, a, a early Qing dynasty painter, um, and uh, just this beautiful river landscape uh, that, you know, I wish we had more time, I would talk more about it. But um, this one, he actually, you know, he signs it with his own name and, and, and you know, it, he's not saying it's by Shi Tao. So that was the Schlenker collection, but uh, Charles Mason was also able to acquire uh, some very important examples of, uh, you know, contemporary Chinese painters. Uh, this one by the artist Wang Wangyi, famous for his synthesis of, uh, you know, cultural revolution propaganda imagery with advertising from the West and suggesting that, uh, you know, propaganda and advertising share some commonalities. 
um, in these big dramatic uh, paintings. He did a whole series of these uh, that, uh, you know, were quite, you know, sort of recognized as, as this very well representing this moment in time of what's often called political pop or political irony. Another painting, this is one of the most popular paintings at the Allen. It's, it's often on view and used for a lot of classes and tours. This is by the contemporary painter uh, Zheng Fanzhi, uh, and it's part of his mask series from the late 90s and early 2000s uh, that highlight the tension of the rapid uh, commercialization and industrialization of China in the wake of uh, the reform era. And uh, it shows a, 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 you know, a man seated in, dressed in a Western suit but when you look closely at it, you can see that his hands and are sort of, he has this sort of red tint to his skin and uh, he's wearing this mask in a sense to kind of hide the tension uh, that he's feeling in uh, during this time of great uh, cultural and, and economic foment in China. It's really a wonderful painting. It's quite large as well. Uh, Charles Mason was also uh, with the support of the Carpenter Foundation able to uh, purchase a number of paintings, including this important uh, modern oil painting by, uh, by Liu Haisu, who is considered, in a sense, the father of oil painting in China, uh, mastered the techniques of oil painting. Um, and and this, the cockfight was done during visits to Southeast Asia, this one done in Bali. Uh, very, very important painter. He's one of the few, I think he may be the only uh, modern Chinese painter to have a museum, a national level museum uh, devoted to his work uh, in China. Uh, Charles was also able to get some uh, works uh, from you know, the Cultural Revolution era, uh, political paintings. Uh, one of them, the most important one of them, uh, is by the artist Shen Jiawei, and it's an image of uh, Zhou Enlai, uh, the sort of number two man under, under Mao during the uh, Long March. So sort of dragging the soldiers, physically dragging them over the mountaintop as they made their way into, uh, into retreat. Um, the wonderful thing about this painting is that we also have all of Shen uh sketches uh, of, you know, the, the figures and color studies and all that. So it's a wonderful opportunity for uh, people in, in the painting department, studio art to, uh, to study, uh, you know, a working painter at the heights of his powers. So uh, Charles was actually the last curator of, of Asian art at the Allen. There was a hiatus of about 10 years and then uh, our director, Andrew Durstein, was able to uh, get uh, an endowed position uh, funded by uh, Jonel Danforth um, and, you know, and also with uh, partial funding from the National Endowment to the, for the Humanities. And, and I was lucky enough to be the first uh, Jonel Danforth curator. And since my time uh, here, uh, I've been working with a lot of different things, uh, not, specific, not just Chinese painting. But one thing that I'm very proud of was the shepherding of a very important gift of ink paintings by Liu Haisu, who, as I mentioned, was this famous oil painter. But during the Cultural Revolution, he uh, in, wasn't able to get th those kinds of materials, uh, the oil painting materials. And he actually turned to traditional ink painting. Uh, and, uh, you know, even though he was under very difficult circumstances in his life, he was, you know, uh, persecuted by the Red Guards and, and, and other, you know, was forced to clean toilets, uh, things like that. But he was still actively painting. And he was, uh, a, a friend of his was a grad, an Oberlin graduate, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Shi uh, Yan Wu, uh, part of three generations of, of Oberlin uh, students. And Dr. Wu was able to, in a sense, kind of support uh, Liu Haisu during the 70s, during this difficult time by, you know, purchasing paintings from him. Uh, and uh, so we've actually got about eight of these ink paintings uh, that are, that are, you know, coming into, into our collection, being accessioned a little by little over time. And I'm uh, very excited to bring some of these uh, in, out in exhibitions, in upcoming exhibitions. Uh, the last work I wanna look at that, that I was uh, involved with, uh, this is actually a photograph by the artist uh, Yang Yongliang. Um, and it's a, it's a sort of a photographic collage, but you can see it's, it's debts to the traditions of Chinese painting. If we zoom into it, it looks like, you know, it could have come out of the, the Southern Song Dynasty, right, with these misty mountains. But when you zoom in, you can see that the mountains are created out of like these apartment complexes. And down below, there's all this rubble and, and you know, destruction uh, that is a comment on the rapid 
you know, urban change and rapid, you know, changes to the environment in China in uh, in this the reform period and uh, during the, this you know wonderful you know uh, economic success that China has uh, has uh, enjoyed over the, the past few decades, but maybe kind of the dark side of that. So that was a brief overview of the history and highlights of the collection. I want to turn now to just a few examples of selected exhibitions in which I've used uh, some of the, the permanent collection. Uh, let's start with one of the first shows I did uh, in 2015 was called Psychosomatic Visions of the Body in Contemporary East Asian Art. And there in the, in, in the background, you can see the uh, uh, Zhang Jure painting, as well as uh, a painting by Hong Liu, uh, a, a, a artist who was born in China, you know, edu educated in socialist realist painting, but then left to uh, come to the US. Now she's a US citizen. Uh, and in the middle, uh, that is a Kusama Yayoi uh, sculpture, <laughs> not a Chinese painting by any means, but uh, just, you know, a, a tribute to all the wonderful things that we have in our collection. Uh, another exhibition uh, that I did was called Conversations Past and Present in Asia and America that uh, was rooted in this idea that uh, many contemporary artists in, in the U.S. and in uh, China were working with, or, or in Asia, were working with uh, the you know Asia and America, the past and the present in some of their uh, in some of their work. I started with uh, a collection of ceramics, not Chinese paintings, but just to give you a sense of uh, these conversations over time that I argued. Uh, this is uh, Elsa Raddy here, uh, whose uh, whose work is uh, in you know that sort of uh, Song de Boeuf style from uh, from China uh, decoration. Uh, this is a beautiful Young Jung period. Uh, uh, Celadon vase, and you can see Fukami Suharu from Japan working in, in that kind of mode. Uh, Brother Thomas Besenson from, uh, from Canada in, in this piece here, working in a kind of Song Dynasty, uh, you know, iron glazed uh, black ware. Down below, uh, Christopher Brewer working with a salt glaze, very reminiscent of Tang uh, Sansai ware. And Kamada Koji, uh, whose modern interpretations of the hair's fur and oil spot glazes of the Song Dynasty are so impressive. Uh, another one, just brief, I, I know I'm supposed to be talking about Chinese painting, but I can't help myself. Uh, this is uh, the American artist Arlene Sheckett, whose work uh, here is, sur is surrounding uh, a Qing dynasty of blue and white from the Qianlong period. Uh, her work is kind of a conversation with the traditions of blue and white, but also blueprints and uh, the Buddhist mandala as kind of a blueprint for an architectural structure. It's a fascinating thing going on with her work. But in the background, you can see where I've combined, compared the Wang Guangyi with some of his influences. On the right, propaganda posters from the Cultural Revolution period. On the left, uh, Roy Lichtenstein, a great example of pop art. And the three of them just work together beautifully in the exhibition. Other paintings that I brought together uh, for the show in, an, in another iteration uh, that dealt with the literati tradition, I brought the Wang Jian, Wang Yanqian, and Zhang Daiqian paintings together with a painting by the contemporary American artist Arnold Chang the incomparable Arnold Chang, such a wonderfully gifted artist, uh, you know, trained by C.C. Wong in the traditions of literati painting, and he's taking it into really interesting directions. He's also a wonderful a connoisseur of traditional Chinese paintings, work for Sotheby's and Christie's. Anyway, I was really glad to bring those together. Another wonderful pairing, I haven't really talked about calligraphy a whole lot, but we have some great calligraphy. Uh, this by uh, uh, Mao Xiang, the great 17th century uh, calligrapher, part of the, uh, the group of, of Dong Chi Chang and, and, and his group. But here he's, he's taken a text from the Ming Dynasty by Yun Hong Dao, waiting for the moon at six bridges, talking about the beauties of Westlake and all the wonderful people that were out in the summertime enjoying the, uh, the scenery, um, and written it out in this beautiful calligraphy. And I paired that with a work of calligraphy by the contemporary American artist, Michael Cherney, who uh, is mostly known for his photography that uh, references Chinese painting, but he's also a calligrapher. And this work is Bob Dylan's Thoughts on Woody Guthrie, translated into Chinese and written out in this beautiful cursive calligraphy by Michael Cherney. So conversations with the past in a really literal way, both in Mao Xiang's work and in Michael Cherney's work. Almost to the end here, a recent exhibition I was really proud of, of the Three Friends of Winter, uh, bringing together the uh, pine plum and, and bamboo, this traditional symbol of resilience and uh, spring and all that. Uh, and there is a painting by Liu Hai Su on the left, a painting of, uh, of plum branches 
done at a very dark phase in his life, but representing the, the, the hope for renewal, the hope for change. And finally, previews. Get ready, everyone. Coming soon <laughs> to a museum, maybe not near you, but uh, here at Oberlin. Uh, in the fall of 22, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing uh, landscapes in blue and green, bringing together some of those blue and green traditional landscapes from our uh, collection, including at the lower left, this Korean uh, 10 panel screen that was recently conserved at the National Museum of Korea and on view there. It was a gift from King Gojong, the King of Korea, to an Oberlin graduate who was working as a missionary in Seoul uh, and an educator uh, and had a relationship with, with the king. Um, and uh, anyway, it's this wonderful connection to, uh, to, that, uh, to that period in Korean history. And we were so glad that the museum, the National Museum of Korea uh, gave us a grant to have it conserved and they put it on view and it's just gotten back to, to us here uh, at Oberlin. And finally, I'm bringing together all of those Liu Hai Su paintings with the Shen Jiawei paintings and some other paintings to talk about two visions of modern Chinese painting, the sort of socialist realist mode, but also kind of traditional ink painting uh, and how that all that all played out. So I may, I hope I haven't gone too long here, but I'm uh, happy to uh, stop right now and just stop sharing. And I'll be happy to take questions uh, from anyone who has questions. Okay, uh, the first question is from Janice McGloves. And uh, it is, what pigments are used in these paintings? That's a great question. So, so typically, uh, in traditional Chinese paintings, uh, the the black is from you know carbon, uh, carbon black, uh, you know ink that's made from uh, pine soot typically, um, and uh, that's the black. But as far as the other colors, typically they are mineral pigments, things like malachite, azurite. So you know very uh, you know sort of high end, ra rather expensive pigments. But because they are mineral based. They, uh, you know, they, they're very durable, right? So those those greens and blues are still extremely bright uh, in these paintings. Um, in some cases, there's some organic pigments as well, but uh, those are kind of the main uh, the main pigments that we see in these in these works. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another question we have is from, uh, excuse me. Susan Hansen. She says, "Thank you for your presentation. Beautiful works and amazing variety." Please talk about what it takes to put on an exhibition. It looks like it takes several years. Absolutely, yeah. We we it takes uh, we're, we're you know a few years out with uh, these plans. Um, you really have to have things uh, things worked out. For example, if, if a work needs to be conserved, you know you have to get that uh, in the pipe pretty early on. Uh, if you're going to do a loan from another museum, uh, you know that also has to be set up you know well ahead of time. So um, that is, uh, you know, kind of, those are some of the real early things that need to happen. Um, at our museum, it, it, it's a very small staff. We really only have a few people working here. So, um, you know, I am sort of the, the designer, you know, exhibition designer, as well as the planner. I use um, Google SketchUp, or it's no longer Google SketchUp, but SketchUp to kind of, which is a 3D uh, computer program, kind of like a video game, <laughs> where I can move things around and put them on the walls and change them to kind of get a, an, an initial idea of what's going to fit and what, what works well together. Um, and then, um, you know, kind of get my checklist together. We have to go through an approval process, uh, you know, at, at the museum. Um, and then, you know, determine what gallery we're going to use and all that. Um, but we've got a wonderful, uh, you know, wonderful staff of preparators, two, two preparators that, that do the hard work of, you know, making the cases and, you know, and installing the works, um, you know, painting the walls, painting the cases, all that kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a very involved process. Um, I, you know, in the back of my head, I'm always kind of thinking of, of new ideas and new possibilities. And uh, some of those, you know, kind of drift up to the top and end up uh, becoming actual exhibitions. Um, but uh, anyway, that, that gives you a little sense. It, it, is, it is a very involved process. It takes a lot of time um, to do. Great, thank you. Um, going back to the pigments, Joanne Wakeland asks, how do you get the white pigment in Chinese paintings? Yeah, so white is actually, most often it's just the, the paper. You know, they just sort of let the paper show through and paint around it. Uh, but sometimes there, there is a, a, white, uh, a white pigment, different, different uh, types 
of uh, of white uh, that are that are used as you know sort of a highlighted addition uh, to to paintings. But but typically it's actually just the the white of the of the silk or of, of the paper um, that's the you know the medium. Okay, our next question comes from Wendy Larson. Oh. Tang Xiaobing argues that Wang Guangyi in his combination of CR poster type images and Western advertising shows the continuing relevance of socialism in China. However, it seems like there are many possible interpretations. What is yours? <laughs> I, I think that Wang Guangyi was, was someone who, you know, lived during a time when you know, suddenly things had opened up, the, the reforms in the wake of uh, Deng Xiaoping um, allowed advertising to appear, uh, you know, on the streets of, of China. And uh, I think that uh, Wang immediately recognized that some of those, those same, you know, manipulatory techniques that he was so familiar with from propaganda work was, were being used in these, in these advertising, advertising works. Um, and, and that was, I think, his initial inspiration for, for these works. Um, I think they're a lot of fun, right? I think they have a certainly a playful quality to them. Um, the artist, uh, I mean, I, I hate to call him kind of a, a, a one-hit wonder, but you know, I, I haven't seen a lot of work, other work from Wang Guangyi since this this amazing series that made such a big impact. Um, of course, it could be argued that you know a lot of this stuff was really attractive to Western buyers who saw these sort of political associations and. You know, perhaps he and some other uh, contemporaries were, you know, doing things for that for that market. I mean, I, I think that's definitely part of uh, part of the history here. Um, but I, I think there are a lot of fun, and I was really excited to, to find um, that that particular poster because it uh, makes use of the of of imagery or a style. Uh, that came out of the modern woodcut movement, which was, you know, this really early uh, period of, of socialist art even before the revolution. Um, and, you know, the sort of bold outlines and, and thick strokes. And that, you know, influenced this, this uh, movement of, of political posters in, in the 70s. And, and in a sense that those bold outlines and, 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 and bold forms uh, were really easy to kind of interpret directly into, uh, into what Wang was doing with um, his exaggerations. You know that were inspired by pop art. So really, really, um, really a great question. Thank you very much, uh, Wendy, uh, for that. Great. Um, just a quick, more logistical question. Um, can you send a link to your collection online, specifically the Schlenker collection paintings? And if you check in the chat, Catherine has already um, sent the link there. So feel free to copy and paste it. Um, for anyone that's having a difficulty um, getting it out of the chat, um, you can also email for Saturday PDX and we'll send the link via email. And if you get to the website uh, and you know click on art and then in the search box, just, just put Schlenker. Uh, you know, there aren't any other Schlenkers in the collection. So anything with that credit line of Schlenker will, will pop up uh, in, your, in your list. So um, that's probably the easiest way to do it. Thank you. Um, another question is, are you publishing a catalog for the upcoming paintings in the Blue Green Show? Not in the Blue Green Show, but we are in discussions uh, about getting a, a catalog for the Shenzhouwei uh, Liu Haisu show a couple years down the road. Um, one of the reasons that this, this collection isn't that well known is it, it hasn't been that well published. Um, and so that's one of the things that I'm, I'm you know, little by little, piece by piece uh, working on. Um, if you do go to the the e, the e museum website, some of the paintings in the collection have uh, catalog entries that are downloadable as a PDF. Um, so that those, you know, but not all of them. So I'm doing uh, I'm doing what I can, and I hope that uh, that upcoming uh, two visions of Chinese modern painting will be uh, the first of hopefully many moving forward. There are uh, more questions actually, coming. Actually, one, one thing real quick. I also hasten to point out that um, my, my backdrop here is one of those blue and green paintings. Um, and this is downloadable. It's a, it's a zoom, you know, a zoom background that, or, you know, it can be a you know, background on your, on your uh, desktop as well. Um, if you go to, uh, I think it's in the, in the, should be in the chat as well. There should be a link to the page that has 
uh, many works from our collection that are downloadable as uh, possible desktops or, or Zoom backgrounds. So I forgot to mention that earlier on. Sorry, Jen, go ahead. That's no problem. I, I like that last bit too. Um, <laughs> we've got a lot of questions coming in. Thank you so much. I will keep going. Um, the next one is, do or did the artists have students or have schools of artists? Absolutely. Uh, you know, it, well, it kind of depends on the artist, but but typically, uh, well, uh, let me put it this way. Um, art historians have classified stylistic, you know, affinities and groups as this school and that school. So um, that's typically the way the term school is used in art history, right? The Anhui school or the, the Orthodox school. And that's the way I was using that, um, that, that term. But, um, you know, it's kind of more on a case by case basis uh, as to who literally studied with, you know, this master or that master. Um, a lot of times artists, you know, were exposed to examples of the work of other artists, you know, through, uh, you know, private collections. And, you know, this is a very elite sort of art form, uh, certainly the literati style, you had to actually have access to these collections, you had to know the right people, if you if you wanted to be, uh, you know, a great painter. Um, but yeah, in some cases, there were, you know, a master disciple relationship, uh, you know, certainly among, you know, professional painters, that was a, a little more common. Um, but, um, you know, understand that I'm using the term school in, in a more kind of art historical way. Great. Um, our next question comes from Edie Millar. What has been your biggest challenge as the curator of Asian art at the Allen Museum so far? And what has been your most satisfying moment? My biggest challenge, I would have to say is you know, we have um, endowed funds for acquisitions, which is great, right? We're able to, we're able to be active uh, buyers on, on the market and continue to expand the collection. Um, the biggest challenge we have right now at the museum uh, is a lack of storage space, right? Um, we, we, you know, we've, we're full. <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, unfortunately, one of uh, the deciding factors in uh, whether or not we acquire a work is, you know, the practicalities of where, where can we store it uh, if it's not going to be on view. Um, so, you know, things like prints and paintings a little bit easier than, than sculptures or, or decorative art objects. Uh, so I would say one big challenge is that, is that storage side. But I mentioned endowments because we don't have an endowment for exhibitions. So in a sense, you know, I, I, sometimes it's, it's a little frustrating um, that, you know, I, I, I want to do, you know, a lot of things with our installations that are maybe a little more, uh, a little more cutting edge, a little more dramatic, but we're limited, you know, by, by funds as to, you know, how far we can go with, um, you know, with, with installation costs. Uh, but uh, I would have to say that my biggest frustration is, um, is our, you know, the, the lack of storage space, but also lack of physical space in the museum for exhibitions. Um, that is a continuing problem for us. I mean, we've got a wonderful museum, we've got a wonderful collection, I, I hate to complain, but you know, if, you know, I don't know, Jeff Bezos or something <laughs> wants to, you know, donate money to put a wing on the museum, we sh we'd sure love to have the Bezos wing, right? Uh, or or uh, his, his ex-wife, who I think is giving money out to people. Yeah, somebody, if, if you know her, give her a call. Um, as far as, um, I, th I, th I think that was what, yeah, I, there was another part of the question that I, I can't remember. Um, what was tacked on at the end there, Jen? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so it was the my, my, my greatest successes and my greatest challenges, was that yes. it? Yes. Okay, I, I, I think I pretty much answered it. Successes, you know, I just, I love working with the collection and I, I try to be as creative as possible with, uh, with the exhibition. So I, th I think that's what I'm probably the happiest about. Great, thank you. Um, we have a, a few questions related to the last painting that you showed. Um, first, just uh, if you could remind us what the name of the painting and artist for the work that shows the traditional landscape painting showing the base of mountains made from modern skyscrapers. Yeah, so so that's actually not a painting. That's a that's a a, a, a photographic collage by the artist Yang Yongliang. So that's uh, the family name is Y A N G. And then the given name is Yong Liang, Y-O-N-G-L-I-A-N-G. -G. He's a really amazing creative artist. 
Um, and he, uh, you know, has done a lot of these photographs. He's also done some wonderful videos and we were able to borrow uh, one of those on loan, uh, a, a video of this nightscape that actually was it was projected on three huge TV screens in the gallery. And that was for uh, a, an exhibition that I did a couple of years ago on um, basically, uh, you know, the rapid change in, uh, in East Asia and how people were responding to the, the, you know, urbanization and densification and all that. It was called Worlds Apart. So if you want to look that up, um, uh, you know, I had, I had a long scroll painting by uh, Yunfei Ji, the amazing painter, uh, and, and works by, uh, uh, a, you know, anyway, there were other, other artists in the collection as well. So um, just look that up on our website. San Sandra Lee was, was another artist in there uh, uh, who, who does work with sort of the detritus of construction sites in, uh, in China and in uh, Korea, uh, South Korea. Um, and it was an amazing combination of sculptures and paintings and, and these video works by uh, Yang Yong Liang uh, that, that I mentioned. Great artist. Uh, Marta Corbett also um, comments on that same image. The last photo you showed with mountains reminded me of the removal of small villages on the river and how people were moved to high rises before the Three Gorges Dam was released and the water line filled the villages. Um, do you know if there was any inspiration from that by the photographer? I'm sure that that was part of it, right? The, the you know, um, I, I don't, I'm not aware of him specifically referencing that, but you know, that was just part of the zeitgeist uh, of, of the time, right? People that were displaced um, by the Three Gorges project, um, but you know, people displaced by urban renewal and all that, right? So displacement's a kind of a big part of, of his subject matter. Yeah, that's a, that's a good connection to make. Um, part three related to that um, image is uh, uh, with, uh, and you spoke of the collection um, exhibition that you had, um, a lot of these images, um, they have clearly a lot of, um, uh, a lot of social commentary. Um, what is, do you know what the reception is for those types of images and art in China? Yeah, you know, as, as I think the subtext of that question is, you know, can you get away with <laughs> social commentary in China? And, you know, as, 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 as long as you're not, at least, you know, things have been a little different under, under Xi Jinping, but uh, as long as you're not directly critiquing the, the, you know, the Communist Party or the government, uh, you can really get away with a lot, right? There's a lot of flexibility. I mean, things, things may have changed in the past five years, but, um, you know, somebody like Yang Yongliang, uh, you know, his, his work, uh, you know, it, I, I, I don't believe he's had any, any trouble in China, but I, but I do know that he is relocated to New York. Uh, he, he had a gallery, has a gallery in New York, uh, where I think he's based now partly in New York and partly in Beijing or Shanghai, sorry, I think Shanghai. Um, so yeah, I, I think that there is a certain amount of freedom as long as you, you know, you're not sort of directly critiquing the government. Um, you know, some artists actually left, you know, left China uh, initially to have a little more freedom and subject matter, but, you know, many of those expatriate artists have, you know, kind of gone back, right? I think the most, you know, egregious example, of course, uh, you know, Ai Weiwei, right, uh, who's um, the most prominent example of a kind of a dissident, really a dissident artist, right? Um, but, you know, a lot of other artists kind of work, you know, a little more under, uh, under the radar. Thank you. Um, Marta Corbett um, also asks, you mentioned there were about 100 original donations from the Freer family, but now there are only around 50. What happened to the others? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, not from the Freer family, but from Mr. F Mr. Freer himself back in 1912. And that was before the museum opened uh, in 1917. Um, they were sold off. They were deaccessioned by earlier, uh, you know, earlier directors or or curators um, over over the decades. I think um, the records, uh, you know, I haven't really gotten into what we lost because I think it would make me cry, <laughs> right? So I, I haven't researched it, but you know, the the Freer uh, Gallery in uh, in DC in the Smithsonian, they they have all the records, and you know, one of these days I have to get there and kind of get in to see if you know there are any further further records about the works that we've got. We have sort of general provenance information, you know, like Mr. Freer purchased this from, you know, Yamanaka or, or whoever. Um, 
but um, yeah, but as far as what was sold off, I think it was a lot of ceramics, uh, paintings, uh, things like that. And um, they, you know, kept the most important works as, as, as far as I understand it. Uh, but to be, to be frank, um, you know, Mr. Freer kind of gave us his, his B list, <laughs> which sounds, I mean, you know, to be honest, you know, Mr. Freer's B list is anybody else's A list, right? But, um, you know, they, they, he saved like his best for, um, you know, for, for the Freer Gallery uh, that he was in the process of, of making uh, in, in Washington uh, that opened in, in 23. So that's, that's my answer there. They, they were sold off over, over the decades. Um, another question comes from Sabina and she asks, um, you said at the beginning of the talk that this collection of Chinese paintings were relatively unknown, only known to some specialists. And your efforts at um, the museum was to make them known. What is your plan to accomplish that goal? Yeah, so as, as I stated earlier, your publication is, you know, we're working on a catalog for this upcoming show. Uh, eventually, I'd love to do a, a catalog of the, the East Asian paintings in the collection, including the, the Japanese paintings, of which there are quite a number of very important ones as well. So just, you know, keep your eyes open. Um, you know, because we're, we're a small department, it's me. <laughs> I have a part-time student assistant. Um, you know, that's, it's a lot of work to get these things done, a, a, as well as keeping up the exhibition schedule and um, all the other things that we have to do uh, as curators. So um, it's, it's, it's a bit of a challenge to find the time uh, to get these things done. But, um, you know, I just keep plugging at it little by little over time. With each exhibition, I, I try to, you know, do kind of a deep dive on, on you know, one painting uh, to kind of build up those catalog entries uh, for the future. I try to kind of work things out that way, but hopefully it'll be out there uh, in, in the future. So stay tuned. Great. Um, another question we've got from Gretchen Quig. I'd like to know more about the literati. It sounded from what you said as though they were trained in the classics, but not successful in the exams. <laughs> The, the literati, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating subject. Uh, and, you know, if you had, had studied Chinese art, you know, maybe 50, 60 years ago, you know, that was really Chinese art. You know, that, that was all that was considered Chinese art was you know, the painting of literati, right? Because um, that, you know, the people that studied Chinese paintings and, you know, the early uh, Western historians studied with, you know, educated people from China. And, you know, they, they considered literati to be the orthodox, you know, the kind of real painting, right? Um, the literati as a style, I mean, you could trace it back to, you know, the Song Dynasty, right, 10th, 11th century. Um, the, it's called literati painting because these were uh, members of the, the educated elite, right, that whose, whose goal was to serve the emperor, to serve in government, uh, to serve the, the country. Um, and so they would take a series of very difficult uh, examinations, the civil service examination at three levels, you know, the, the local, regional, and the national. And if you were able to pass the highest level, the national level, the imperial examination, um, it was like, you know, being elected to office for life and winning the lottery at the same time, right? So it was a great achievement and, and you raise your own status as well as the status of your entire family by doing so. So this was everyone's dream. And it was, you know, quote unquote, a meritocracy. Although obviously if you had money, you could afford to get your sons educated. Uh, and it was, you know, it was only sons only, it was only open to, to men. Um, you know, so although ostensibly, you know, is this op open to anyone, you know, you had an advantage if, if, you know, you were educated from the time you were small in reading and writing and poetry and the eight legged essay that you had to master in order to take these exams. But the exam, you know, they would lock you in a room for like a week and, you know, bring you food and take out, you know, your, your, your wastes. And, uh, you know, you have to answer these elaborate questions. But, you know, if you were able to pass it, it was great. But because it was so difficult, you know, a lot of the highly educated people were not able to get into the government. And, you know, certainly in the, the Yuan Dynasty, when the Mongols were in charge, part of the reason was, uh, you know, because either they didn't want to serve the Mongols if they were, Chinese, you know, Han Chinese, or uh, you know they couldn't get into the government, 
um, with a few exceptions, like the great painter Zhao Mengfu, who did did serve at court. Uh, but as you get into the Ming Dynasty, particularly the late Ming, it was incredibly competitive. You know, like one out of a hundred people could pass even a regional level of, of exam, and even fewer at that higher level. So there were a lot of you know people that had spent their their lives learning all these things to serve in the government and couldn't. So uh, a good fallback was painting. And uh, if you were a good painter, it was part of this elite, you know, world of, of gift exchange where, you know, you would not deign to ask for money, right? That's beneath you if you're an educated elite person. Um, but, you know, somebody, somebody might ask a famous painter, hey, can you come stay with us for a few weeks? And you can stay in, in the guest house and, you know, would love to have you, you know, and then you show up and they, you know, they give you, you know, silk and painting supplies, just if you need it, you know, dabble if you have a, have a minute, right? <laughs> and so through this elaborate um, network, uh, you could get a painting by, you know, famous artists like Shenzhou or whoever of, of, of the day. And that the styles created by the literati of the Ming uh, synthesized elements from great painters of the past. And so to really understand what they were doing, you had to be part of that educated elite group to say, oh, he, here he's doing, you know, uh, Fan Quan, or here he's doing, you know, uh, Nizan or Wang Meng or whatever, right? So it was part of, again, part of this re very restrictive kind of elite group, um, but fascinating, right? And so the more you learn about them and the more you kind of begin to recognize these things and the more you begin to appreciate what these artists are doing, uh, it really uh, rewards you with with that scholarship. So I, I really encourage you to, to kind of study literati art, uh, literati painting, um, you know, particularly the Ming and Qing dynasties, um, if, if you get a chance. I hope, I hope that answers your question. Um, a comment from Anonymous says, thanks for a wonderful lecture. You're welcome. Anonymous. Um, and um, Another question, Pam Quayle asks, a big strokes question. How do Chinese paintings differ from Japanese over the centuries, conversationally? <laughs> well, you know, obviously there's a long standing relationship between China, Japan and Korea for that matter. Um, and in, in Japan, in a sense, they kind of have a, a type of painting that's understood to be, you know, Chinese style paintings, right? So, you know, if you start in like the Muromachi period where there was a lot of trade back and forth with China after a long period of without contact, um, you know, that you start to see painters adopting the styles of, you know, the, the late Song dynasty and, and turning that into a real orthodoxy in Japanese painting known as the Kano school of, of painters and rooted in those, um, you know, Song dynasty and, and well, really early Ming dynasty styles of painting. But Japanese painting is very, very rich outside of that particular connection, right? A lot of unique native styles of painting, you know, you think of the Rimpa school, or the Tosa school, or even the, the Ukiyo-e uh, that, that you may be familiar with from Japanese woodblock prints, completely distinct style of art that was also a style of painting as well. Uh, the subject matter of the, you know, the, um, the, the Edo period, uh, you know, pleasure districts and, you know, uh, travel and all the, the entertainments that were part of that, of that time. So yes, there is a type of Japanese painting that owes a great debt to Chinese painting, but there's a lot more as and that's also true of, of, of Korean art, right? That there, there's a type of it that, that, you know, consciously evokes the, the history of Chinese painting, but uh, others that um, are very uh, distinct. Um, another question comes from Shuju Wang. Any contemporary work from Taiwan? Well, uh, you know, we, we don't. We don't have any contemporary works by any Taiwanese artists. And, and, and I'm glad that you point that out. I'll have to uh, have to do something about that. Although we did have work by you, Shu Chi Wang, in a, in a show a, a little while ago, um, uh, and I think maybe you have some family connections to Taiwan. So I don't know if that counts, uh, but um, yeah, thank thank you for that question, and, and it's something I'll, I'll keep an eye open for because there's some phenomenal things happening uh, in uh, in Taiwan. 
Susan Hansen asks, do you have teaching responsibilities at Oberlin? Do you have time for professional travel and research? So I'll start with teaching. Um, we don't formally uh, teach classes, right? As much as we'd like to, they, they just haven't figured out a way for us to, you know, to get some sort of release from our, our curatorial duties uh, in order to teach a class. Um, and uh, it's, it's frustrating because I love teaching, you know, for all the years that, that I was in, you know, the Portland area. Um, but, I, but I do teach sort of individual classes, right? So classes will come to the museum and, and we'll do uh, something in the galleries or something in the print study room and I'll kind of lead that. Um, or, uh, you know, sometimes I'll do guest lectures uh, in classes, but uh, sadly I'm not teaching any, uh, any regular classes. Um, what was the second part of that question? Something about teaching and and professional research and travel. Yeah, yeah. So yes, we we do have uh, the opportunity every every couple of years to apply for a research leave. Um, I had I had done that. I had a, a research leave lined up for last year. Uh, I had uh, grant money to go to Japan uh, to work on a show about the Ainu people of uh, northern Japan. We're going to do uh, contemporary Ainu art. Uh, I'm working with a professor here at Oberlin, Chia Sakakibra who works with uh, indigenous people. Um, and unfortunately the pandemic uh, intervened. So my first big research, uh, research leave was, uh, it was taken away, but you know, just delayed. I'm sure, you know, things looks like there's a bright light uh, in the future. So hopefully I'll be able to take advantage of that. That is good to hear. <laughs> um, Wendy Larson asks, could you talk about art collectors in China? What are they collecting? And is it a combination of speculation and art appreciation as it is here and elsewhere? Absolutely. It's, it's not an area I, hold, I know a whole lot about, to be honest. But, um, you know, since the tremendous economic success that, that China has had, um, you know, as, as people get money, they, you know, they want to, you know, start to collect art, right? It's the, the thing to do. Um, and it has transformed uh, the art market. Um, you know, I, you may have noticed that I, I really only have one uh, acquisition in, uh, in Chinese art that I showed um, in, in, the, uh, in the show today, um, because the, the, you know, a lot of the times we're priced out of the market because, you know, they're really wealthy people and they're motivated, you know, by, um, by interest in art, but also there's a little bit of nationalism in there as well to, uh, you know, to buy uh, Chinese art. And um, if it's works of traditional art, particularly imperial art, right, uh, stuff from, you know, the, the Qing court or whatever, um, you know, they, they'll pay any price to uh, repatriate that art, right? So, so most famously recently, the, the case of the, uh, the, the bronze uh, fountain heads from the uh, Xianglo in the, in the Yuanmingyan, right, the, the European uh, section of the uh, Summer Palace. Big controversial thing that's, that's worth looking into if, if you're interested in this topic. Um, so yes, so the market has been fundamentally changed by wealthy people in China buying Chinese art um, and uh, more power to them, you know? I mean, after the century of humiliation, right? Uh, go for it, right? I, I, I think that, you know, hopefully they'll have a good effect on, uh, on the art world. And, and they're not, not only buying traditional art, but also, you know, contemporary art is, is really hot in, uh, in the Chinese market as well. Okay. Um, the next question uh, is in reference to the oil painting you shared with us. Um, uh, we often see watercolor and ink um, paintings uh, but can you talk more about the presence and prevalence of um, oils or other uh, media used in Chinese painting? Sure. So I, I showed a couple of oil paintings. So I'm I'm not I'm guessing you mean the Liu Hai Su uh, uh, cockfight painting, right? So you know you don't really see uh, <clears throat> oil painting in China until the 20th century, right? As artists like Liu Hai Su and and, uh, and others, you know, studied Western art uh, and brought things like, you know, drawing from life. And um, in Liu Haisu's case, nude modeling, this was very controversial when he did that. And he was, uh, pro, you know, persecuted by the Republican 
government, <laughs> and then later is persecuted by the by the communist authorities, right? For for uh, you know being uh, you know elitist or whatever. Uh, but um, so oil painting uh, grew into a major uh, a major mode uh, in, in Chinese art, and so the later works that you saw, like Zheng Fangzhi and, and Wang Guangyi, those were examples of of you know how things uh, you know people in in Chinese artists have. Uh, taken oil painting and really made it their own and, and are doing really amazing brilliant things with uh, with oil painting uh, traditions you know very unique uh, to, to contemporary China um, but um, you know they're, they're I, I think uh, really a lot has to be said for some of these early artists uh, like Liu Hai Su who uh, were working in this very new medium and and you know doing portraits and landscapes and, and various other things um, but uh, you know had a phenomenal impact on the later history of, of Chinese art through those experiments. So yeah, oil painting is, uh, is something to really, uh, to really worth studying in Chinese art, definitely. Great, thank you. Um, we are getting close to the end of our time. So we have a, a couple more questions, hopefully we'll get to. Um, and this one comes from uh, Pam Quayle. And Kevin, you spent time in Portland, so hopefully you can speak to this a bit and I also open it up to the audience. If you have any um, insights, feel free to put it in the chat and we'll share that out with everybody. Um, but Pam Quayle asks, I have a hanging, where may I take it to be cleaned and valued and perhaps donated in Portland? Yeah, so, um, you know, unfortunately as a, as a curator, I'm, I'm not allowed to, you know, make any specific suggestions. Um, as to like where to get things appraised or, or uh, where to get things uh, conserved. Um, paint, you know, uh, Asian painting conservation is a very complex field. And you really, if, 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 it's a, if it's a valuable painting or if it's important to you, you know, for personal reasons, you really wanna, you know, go the extra, uh, extra mile to, to make sure you get a, a reputable person. Um, and just you know, search search around uh, for you know for uh, Chinese art conservators. I, I don't know if it's Chinese or Japanese or and, and actually that, that's an issue, right? Um, for a Chinese painting, you really want to get a Chinese art painting conservator, um, you know, because there are different techniques and different methodologies that are used. You know, if you have a Japanese painting, you want a, a Japanese conservator to work on. If you have a Tibetan painting, you want someone who's trained in modes of of you know Tibetan painting conservation. So, um, you know. It, it's, it's uh, you know, it, it's kind of a complex subject. Um, and I think, you know, we're sort of legally <laughs> restricted from giving specific, uh, specific recommendations, but, you know, just, just, you know, poke around and see what you can find and, you know, ask uh, for informal responses from people. Um, you know, I, I'm, you know, I think that's, that's about as far as I can, I can go there. Um, okay, and again, if there's any um, information that the audience has, put it in the chat and we'll share that with um, everybody. Um, another question comes from Mike Roberts. Where can beginners learn how to paint Chinese styles? Are there online programs for beginners? There are, yeah. There, there are a lot of great, um, great teachers out there that do sort of video programs on the basics of, of, of Chinese painting. Um, and I think you can start on YouTube and just look for, you know, Chinese painting instruction. Um, there are a lot of different styles of painting, right? Um, you know, like pro probably the, the easiest one to find is the, the Lingnan style of, of, of watercolor painting that uses, you know, colorful inks and, uh, you know, that, um, there are a lot of great, great instructors in, in that particular style that you can find on, on YouTube. Um, you know, so just just you know, do a little poking around and, and see if if it's something that you know you can respond to. Um, you know, the the supplies are not super expensive. You can get nice paper and nice brushes and and inks uh, through you know various online uh, sources. Probably Amazon. You know, Amazon might even have some some good ones if you poke around a little bit. But there's lots of great uh, YouTube instruction. And then I think you know if if you really get into it, you can invest in uh, you know like. A, DVDs or something that, that give you really step-by-step -step instructions in, in the art of Chinese painting. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really a, a, a wonderful hobby. Um, my, my mother got into it um, early on and, and she loves to, to paint, you know, and she does Lingnan style, that's why I know about it. 
um, you know, study calligraphy as well, and, and uh, you, you'll open up a really marvelous world. And once you start doing the actual strokes and, and you know, the, the actual techniques and think about things and how you compose them, it, it really gives you another dimension for, of appreciation for the great painting, you know, masters of, uh, of Chinese tradition. Where if you actually kind of have a hands-on knowledge and say, wow, is that what they did here? And that's what they did there. So I, I would strongly encourage folks to, to take it up. Thank you so much for that, Kevin. We are unfortunately at the end of our Q&A um, time. There were some questions we didn't get to. If you're able to join us for the tea house later, you can ask them then. Um, otherwise, we will also be asking Kevin and we'll try to get those answers out to um, those that asked it. And as, um, I, as I understand it, I'm gonna be sort of popped into the different breakout groups in, in the tea house. So if I pop into your group, you know, ask your question and I'll be happy to answer it as best I can. Yeah, exactly. Um, and we'll talk more about that when we get into the tea house. Um, again, Kevin, thank you so much for this great talk. Um, I wanted to give you a minute or two or um, more. If you have any final remarks you'd like to say? Just how, how happy I am to, uh, to be able to kind of reconnect with folks at the, at the first Saturday group. Uh, it was always, like I said, the, the highlight of, uh, you know, many of the public talks that I did in the Portland area. Um, I just, you know, I wish I could see you all in, uh, you know, in person. It's so much more fun when you can have an actual, you know, reaction to, uh, to, to your talk. But um, anyway, we do what we can in this, uh, in this environment, in this pandemic. And I'm, I'm glad that um, everyone worked, to get, worked together to do such a phenomenal job of, of uh, doing this program. So thanks. Thanks to all of you. Thank you again, Kevin. Um, thanks everyone for coming and joining us uh, today. Uh, just a reminder, please visit our website, www.firstsaturdaypdx.org. Uh, 